Good morning, everyone. Well, before I start my presentation, I just want to acknowledge my colleague at Rutgers, Dr. Terry Bazon-San, who actually helped me prepare this presentation because I do not actively conduct research in fruits. But he was kind enough to lend me this presentation, and a lot of it's going to be general, and I'm going to give some uh, label updates at the end. So first, let's talk about what is a weed. A weed can be three things. A plant that causes ecological losses or da and damage, something that's going to create health problems for humans or animals, or something that's really undesirable where it's growing, which is where we think of uh, weeds in our lawns and stuff like that. But you know, why does weed control matter? Um, from both, it causes both direct and indirect losses. Um, Direct losses, you know, through reduced uh, crop yield through competition, reduced uh, crop yield through allelopathy, um, reduced harvest efficiency, and, you know, just reduced crop quality and value. And indirect losses through, you know, increased crop production costs, you know, unwanted damage or crop injury, and weeds can also act as hosts for other pests and diseases. So the first thing about controlling weeds is really learning how to identify weeds. I mean, it's going to determine what type of control is needed if you're spraying. You know, just remember, no herbicide controls all weeds. You've got uh, systemic herbicides that work more with your perennial and biennial weeds and your contact herbicides that work more on your annual weeds. Um, being able to identify weeds can also help identify cultural problems, you know, such as poor drainage in your field. Might, you might see more increased yellow nutsedge pressure. If you have a lot of dry areas, you might see a, a lot of spurges in your area. Um, there are a lot of good resources for identifying weeds. Um, weed, um, weed ID guides such as this one. It's a new edition of the Weeds of the Northeast. It's a very useful uh, book. I do recommend that you look, look into purchasing it. It is available on Amazon. Um, there are also, you know, weed ID apps available. Um, one from that I use, two that I use most are ones from Virginia Tech as well as um, the University of Missouri. Kind of a note on when you use these weed ID apps, the more detail you get when, and the more you know about your weed, the better. A lot of these ID apps are going to have have a key feature that allows you to enter in certain morphological features, you know, like whether it has hairs on the stem, the shape of leaves, stuff like that. And there's really with these ID apps, there's a greater chance of a positive ID with your broadleaf weeds more than your grassy weeds, just because those grasses can be really small and really hard to see all those distinguishing characteristics. Um, if, you're use, if you're using one of the, you know, instant Weed ID apps, uh, do recommend that you try to take cl close up pictures or if you're just sending pictures to uh, one of your county agents. Um, details, details, details are very important. You want to have, you know, close ups of certain features of, the, of these plants, um, be, submit multiple pictures and, you know, if you're using the, uh, these Weed ID apps, you know, double check with other resources such as these Weed ID D guides. Um, honestly, one of the things I've, I've tried using those apps that instantly tell you what a weed is, and they don't work that well. They'll tell you if something is a broadleaf or a grass, but they're not going to tell you what it is. And another thing to remember with all of these sources are, you know, all plants are weeds, are weeds, are weeds, but, or excuse me, all weeds are plants, but not all plants are weeds. Just keep in mind that, you know, stuff that's been considered, we've had con been considered weedy for several years is going to be in these books. If you find a random plant on, your for on the edge of your property, on the tree line or something, you might not be able to find it in these weed ID apps. Next thing about weed classification that's important to know is whether or not you're dealing with annuals or perennials. You know, you've got your scent summer annual weeds that are going to basically germinate in the spring, their vegetative period is going to be in the summer, and they're going to set seed in the fall, versus your winter annual weeds that are going to germinate in the fall, 
grow, grow more in the winter and then set seed in the spring. That's really going to affect when you want to control these weeds because your summer annual weeds, best time to control them is going to be in the spring. Um, winter annual weeds, you know, fall and early winter control is going to be the best time. Um, your biennial weeds, those are going to have basically two life cycles. Um, the first year, they're going to seed in the fall and winter and they're going to have this kind of rosette period in the spring and summer. Then the, then the following year, they're going to start to bolt, which is what we call this, you know, vegetative upward growth here. And, you know, once those biennial weeds start to bolting, they're really, you're really past the period of good control. Then you have your perennial weeds, which are going to grow from seed. They're going to look, the first few, few weeks or so, they're going to look similar to your um, annual weeds, but then they're going to produce uh, this underground rhizome or stolen type structures that are really going to help feed the plant from going forward. So something like a contact herbicide, not going to be really effective against these perennial weeds. So just an example of why correct ID matters. You see all of these species look the same. They all have kind of a rosette. But one of, the, one of these species is an annual, one of these species is a biennial, and one of these species is a perennial weed that's on the Maryland noxious weed list. So we've got mare's tail, that's an annual weed, uh, musk thistle, biennial weed, and Canada thistle. Your the methods you use to control the, the, all these weeds are going to be very different. Another thing about correct ID and control, you know, Good control might be a tactic like mowing a summer annual weeds to help remove the flowers and you know, prevent that seed of production. Um, bad practice would be cultivating something with rhizomes like Canada thistle that's just gonna spread that weed and uh, introduce it to new places in, on your farm. Or you know, using a contact herbicide on a perennial weeds that's just going to kill everything that's the foliage above ground. It's got, not going to do anything for those perennial structures and that weed will emerge from those perennial structures. Next step in good weed management is going to be prevention. Um, using things, attackers like you know, weed-free irrigation water um, and really just preventing weeds from going to seed on your field edges and your borders. Just don't worry about the weeds in your crop, worry about you know stuff that might be coming coming in from unwanted areas as well. Also, you can uh, reduce seed viability through other processes like composting or, or natural mulches. Just be sure that you're composting long enough and not really introducing any additional weed seed in, in your mulches. And I'll give you an example of that next. And you know, clean equipment bef from, before moving into infested fields. Just a few pictures of uh, weed prevention and how, to, how we can avoid that problem. Here we see you know, a clean brush mower versus a brush mower covered in dandelion. Here's a picture of a Carolina redroot introduced into cranberry mulch. Um, in New Jersey, they do use uh, cranberry mulch in their blueberries, but, they, but Carolina redroot it has been a, a persistent problem for a couple years in that state in cranberry and when that mulch isn't properly composted you know this is what you get you just get an additional weed in your blueberries next step once you know what weeds you have and what your, the history of your field you know scouting for weeds is a good tactic you know it lets you know what specific weeds are present or are there any specific conditions that allow those weeds to be present one thing I do recommend is this book right here. This is uh, Manage Weeds on Your Farm, A Guide to Ecological Strategies. This is actually free as a PDF from the SARE, S-A-R-E website. A lot of good information about individual weed species and what, what kind of conditions they really thrive in and what are some of the best um, non-chemical control tactics you can use. You know, what, I mean, are these weeds going to be at a certain stage where it's better to control them with cultivation? Um, how severe are, do the infestations really need to be for you to think about managing them? Um, another thing to think about when you're scouting for weeds is, you know, previous herbicide applications and would we see any type of injury from your current or uh, 
future applications. And are there any herbicide resistant weeds in your field? I know here in Maryland, we have a lot of problems with uh, Palmer amaranth. Uh, we also have uh, resistant smooth pigweed. We have resistant common ragweed. Um, and other stuff that you know you really need to be aware of. So when you're scouting for weeds, just remember that you know not all weeds are going to emerge at once. This chart just shows a good example of you know what types of weeds we have and when they're likely to emerge. So if you know you've got, for example, dandelions a problem weed, you can expect that to kind of urge in the early spring. But a lot of uh, the grasses you might see, especially your foxtails, you know, green foxtail, your barnyard grass, you know, you're going to see emergence really from May to uh, mid-June likely. Now when you're scouting, it's important to scout, you know, not just once, but multiple times during the season. In general, you know, you know weed survey prior to that pre-application, maybe a close bloom weed survey. Uh, you definitely want to uh, see, do a weed survey after your post-emergence herbicide application just to make sure it's worked and, if, and to see if you might have any resistance issues. Um, do that post-harvest weed sur survey after, after all your crops are out of the ground and you're not managing it anymore just to kind of get, an, uh, again, an idea of you know, what species you might be dealing with next year and uh, that, another weed survey fire, prior to that fall pre-emergence. Usually when you do your survey, it's just two to three stops per acre for about 30 feet and just record, you know, what weeds are present in your field, uh, the growth stage of those weeds, you know, the density uh, of the infestation and, and, you know, what stage your crops are at and how your crop looks. So going into some more active management tactics, just looking at some non-chemical tactics between rows. Um, Basic in-crop cultivation, you know, shall, sh doing shallow and frequent cultivation. You know, you really want your weeds to be smaller, about less than two inches tall. A again, a lot of weeds can spread through rhizomes, and a lot of weeds, once they grow, get bigger than three, four inches tall, they tend to reroot. You know, cult cultivation does have its benefits and its drawbacks, and it does eliminate um, weeds for the short term does improve water penetration, your root pruning, but, and it also increases the oxygen level of your soil, oxidizing that organic matter, and, it will, and that will also release some of the absorbed nutrients. But with long-term damages, we've seen it with you know, tillage over years, uh, soil erosion, wind and water, you're gonna reduce the organic matter content of your soil, um, destroy the soil surface, um, those roots are going to be much more vulnerable to disease and that soil is going to have a little bit lower nutrient and water holding capacity. Another non-chemical weed control tactic is going to be, you know, permanent sod, you know, something like tall fesca, fescue. Um, however, this does take a while to establish and weed control is necessary while you're establishing it. Something like uh, using Pral H2O to control summer annual grasses and um, using 2,4-D to control broadleaf weeds. Uh, again, this has both pros and cons to it. You've got uh, your long-term benefits is you're not tilling the soil, so there's less compaction. Um, you're going to decrease water runoff from that soil by having that crop uh, sod in the ground. Water penetration is going to be better. Uh, your organic matter, so you're going to ma maintain that. And it's going to provide some uh, traction for your equipment when it gets wet. Um, short term, um, sod does compete for nutrients in water and there can still be the development of weeds uh, that, that will also can, you know, compete with your crop for nutrients, attract you know, pollinators, and, and you know, those weeds, like I said before, can harbor pests and other diseases. Um, Non-chemical weed control you know, along the row, something like an organic mulch, a pine bark, straw, leaf mulch, those composted clippings, um, any type of pruning residues. Um, that, you know, mulch on the ground, that's basically going to exclude light. So a lot of your small seeded uh, summer annual weeds will not get enough light to emerge from that. Um, like um, the sod is going to increase your organic matter content, your moisture retention is going to be, be better. 
and it's going to help reduce soil erosion. And some mulches will actually have allelopathy or demonstrate allelopathy, which I mentioned earlier, which is just where you know, that decaying residue is going to send out a chemical that's going to prevent other weeds from opening, germinating or establishing. You know, disadvantages, you know, not all weeds are going to be controlled. I said, you know, good for summer annual weeds, small seeded stuff, but those larger seeded um, summer annual weeds and in those perennial weeds, um, they're going to be able to go through that mulch. There's also the issue with that high carbon to nitrogen ratio um, that will actually take away some of the nutrients, the nitrogen from your crop, so you will need to increase your fertilization. Um, might see some suppression of crop growth, and there might be a possible yield pr production reduction. Does anybody have any questions about non-chemical weed control before I move on? Yes. Well, I have a very small garden, four vegetables in the grow, well, fruit. But we, we have used, it, uh, used that, and I get it uh, a rain-flowing Pennsylvania, and a woven cloth. And we, we grow, you know, and we put it down after we till everything, make our rain beds, and we have really found it keeps the weed down. But the trick with it is you have rain or activity in the, in the garden just yourself. You have to keep the loose dirt. You, know, you just get a stiff brush, brush it off because the weeds will, will settle just from the seeds through the air. Yes. But it really does. Uh, when we lift it up in the spring, because it has several years like we lift it up and clean it, it really, it really, really helps a lot. And it, it's not expensive. I think a roll is about $38. Okay. And, uh, and I think it has 300 feet. Um, and it's 36 inches wide. But it is, it's really a good product. Um, if you don't want to go with the herb, like me, I want to try to stay away from the herbicides because everything's so close together. That. And, and it does help uh, quite a bit. And it's called rain flow in Pennsylvania. Okay. It's right over in York County or Lancaster County. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Now, moving on into chemical weed control, um, we've got, I'm going to talk about pre emergence herbicides and post emergence herbicides. Just the thing to remember about pre emergence herbicides, it's they will not kill emerged weeds present at the time of application. And even, even those smaller weeds are going to have roots that are going to allow them to escape from those pre-herbicides. Um, they really do not prevent weeds from germinating. They kill the weeds as they grow through the herbicide layer, and they're not going to kill any dormant seed, seeds. A good uh, reference for looking at all the different chemicals you can spray on, on you know, orchards and other things is going to be this 2023 bulletin for commercial fruit, fruit growers. I believe there is a copy of that uh, or an uh, advertisement for that in your packet. But again, just some general notes uh, on pre-emergence herbicides. They are not uh, barriers and they must reach a treated zone to really be effective either through irrigation or rainfall or mechanical incorporation. So what am I talking about? So when you spray your pre-emergence herbicide, you've got that herbicide layer on the top of the soil surface. And then when it rains, um, that herbicide is actually going to get into that treated zone. But again, not all weeds are going to be affected by those pre-emergence herbicides. You've got you know, your grasses and your pigweeds, these small seed weeds in the treated zone, they're going to grow into the treated, through that treated zone. As they emerge, they're going to be taking in that herbicide, which is going to kill them. But some of these uh, larger seeded things, things like common ragweed, um, they're actually going to start growing and they're going to grow through that treated zone and a lot of them will be fine. Some tips for using a pre-emergence herbicide. Um, just remember that these pre-emergence herbicides are going to remain active in the soil for months and, it and this activity is really going to depend on your soil type and what kind of environmental conditions you have. You might get some rain to wash that, those pre's into the treated zone, but you might get too much rain and they would wash out of that treated zone. You know, not, all, remember, not all herbicides are going to be safe on all crops or on both bearing and non-bearing plants. 
when you use pre-emergence herbicides, remember, you're not going to control emerged weeds, so you really need to start clean and have nothing on the soil. Um, spring application before bud break, and those pre-emergence herbicides, really, remember, you're going to have to adjust your rate based on your soil conditions, your pH, and your organic matter. Um, if you're spraying, be sure to ma you're making uniform spray coverage and your sprayer equipment is calibrated properly. Um, rainfall, mentioned, is crucial for activation. Usually with these pre-emergence herbicides, you need about a half inch of rainfall and irrigation, not with drip irrigation. Just using drip irrigation is pretty much just going to wash your herbicide out of that treated zone. And you really need to have that rainfall or irrigation within, you know, seven to ten days. And, you know, given the fact that not all pre-emergence herbicides or herbicides in general are going to control all weeds, you know, tank mixes may be necessary. And once you've applied your uh, pre-emergence herbicide, it's a pretty good idea not to kind of reduce the traffic and not to do disturb the ground any more than you already have. Um, here's an example of uh, some of the pre-emergence herbicides available uh, for orchards. Like I said, you've got a lot of herbicides available, and there are more herbicides and stuff available in those guides, but just to kind of quickly go through this, um, you've got your different herbicide groups, your threes, your fives, your twelves. Um, some of them work very well on both annual grasses and broadleaf weeds. Some of them only work on certain broadleaf weeds, like you know, Pro H2O, good for annual grass control, good for good for smaller broadleaf control. Um, things like you know, Gold Chateau, uh, common herbicides, real, also good on annual broadleaves. Not so not so good on grasses, but it's a pre-emergence product. But you know, it also has some post-emergence activity. If you spray the weeds when you're sm small enough, you're, or you're not completely clean at planting, but you have a little some small weeds, you know, you're still going to get some activity from that goal to XL or chateau type operations. Um, again, uh, a lot of pro your combination products like Pindar GT. Um, they're going to allow you to pick up more, thing, more annual broadleaves and, and some of that post broadleaf activity. Uh, looking at using chemical weed control and post emergence herbicides, two important things to remember as you've got two types of herbicides contact herbicides and systemic herbicides. Those contact herbicides, they are only going to affect the part of the plant they touch, good for annual wheat. So, weeds, not so good for you know, uh, biennial and perennial weeds. Good spray coverage with these herbicides is critical, and most of your contact herbicides are non-selective, are non um, including you know, any of your organic herbicides that you might be using. Those are all going to be non-selective contact herbicides, things like gramoxone, aim, and those herbicidal oils. Your systemic herbicides, those are going to be the herbicides that are going to move throughout the plant, so your spray coverage isn't going to be as critical for controlling these weeds. For your systemic herbicides, you've got two, two more types. You've got selective, things like 2,4-D that are only going to control broadleaf weeds, and your non-selective herbicides, things like uh, glyphosate. Um, examples of some post-emergence weeds for apple and peach. Um, Again, you've got your selective herb post emergence herbicides, your grass herbicides, your group one, things like Select Max, Post, and Fusillade, only going to take care of some of the, those annuals and a little bit of those perennial grasses, but they're not going to take care of any of those broadleaf weeds. Then you've got um, some, your broadleaf products like Sandia and Matrix. Um, they're going to provide mostly good broadleaf activity, and even Matrix will provide some residual activity. Um, your group four herbicides, uh, things like Embed and Weed R64 and Stinger. Uh, Embed and Weed R64 are both uh, 2,4-D type products. Embed is a, a newer product from Corteva that actually has uh, that 2,4-D choline salt that is, that is uh, designed to reduce volatility. So if you're worried about you know, drift onto other crops, that might be a good option to use rather than just your standard 2,4-D. Um, your non-selective post-emergence her 
herbicides, um, again, things like glyphosate, uh, many brands, um, systemic herbicide, just be careful uh, if you're using glyphosate to eat on, either in your pre planning or your post harvest operation to make sure you don't, it doesn't drift onto any of any unwanted plants. Uh, Rely 280, same thing as Liberty, that's uh, glufosinate. That's going to help control your annual weeds and that is a contact herbicide. Again, coverage is going to matter with that. And then uh, Gramoxone Paraquat, really going to help with those, we those small annual weeds and even a little bit larger annual weeds. But that's, um, this is a contact herbicide as well. So again, spray coverage is critical if you're using this. Um, notes on using post-emergence herbicides. Again, never let one of those non-selective herbicides like glyphosate come into contact with green tissue. Um, if you're spraying and you need to be sure, you know, use protective shields around those new tree, tree plantings that cannot prevent that drift. Uh, weed size does matter. Uh, those non-selective herbicides herbicide like glyphosate really doesn't matter too much on how how big the weed gets you don't want it to get too tall but with when you're using something like rely or germoxin one of those contact herbicides you still really want those weeds to be uh, less than three inches tall so um, you get good spray coverage and you and you don't see as much a high weed density with that um, be aware of that I mentioned earlier herbicide resistance in your field and often you will need to use some psych type of surfactant. So be sure and read the label to see if any of that stuff is required. Um, some quick product updates. Um, one thing I wanted to be you know, all to be aware of is uh, Norfluorazon is currently under a re-registration for decision from the EPA. The EPA has actually impose certain label mitigations for norfluorazon. Um, these label mitigations primarily have to do with the Endangered Species Act. Um, the EPA is taking a uh, stronger role uh, in making sure that none of these herbicides that are being registered or re-registered are going to affect any of our endangered species. Fortunately, in Maryland, we only have about two to four endangered species that we really are concerned with. Um, as opposed to, you know, out, if you're growing fruits out west in California where you might have hundreds of endangered species you're worrying about. But these endangered, these mitigation measures are mainly used to help reduce runoff. Um, some of the proposed mitigation man measures are, you know, the mandatory restriction on the number of treated acres for your crops, um, reduced rates for your coarse textured soils, you know, a lot of of our soils here on Delmarva, those sandy loam soils, you know, for you know, alfalfa, your apple, asparagus, and, uh, and if you happen to have a place warm enough here to grow citrus. Uh, spray drift management, most are already general practices, but um, they are proposing adding droplet size requirements, which would mean you would only be allowed to use certain nozzles to spray an orflores on or a solicam. And I will say that these measures have not been adopted yet. There is still a public co comment period that ends March 8th. So if you're interested in making, co making comments and looking over that entire docket, you can uh, go to this website or go to the EPA website and just uh, enter the word SOLICAM. A uh, couple product updates. Uh, there's a new product called Centrus from Helena. It's a combination of Allion and Matrix, uh, registered for poem and stone fruit. Uh, if you're going to use this product, the trees must be planted for at least three years. Uh, application rate's going to be about 3.9 to 5.6 ounces per acre without exceeding six ounces per year. And there's a 14-day pre-harvest interval. Another product update, a uh, new product from M UPL is going to be Motif. Um, this actually has the same active ingredients, uh, amizotrione, similar to Broadworks, which some of you may have used in the past. Also uh, registered for poem and stone fruit. Um, the trees need to be established for at least 12 months, and there's a 30-day PHI. 
And the last product I mentioned earlier, uh, Chateau, this is flumioxazine. Um, there's going to be a new formulation, Chateau EZ. This is a liquid formulation. Um, that's going to be replacing the dry formulation of uh, Chateau. So just to wrap things up, now really don't rely on just a single strategy. Very important to scout your field regularly and know what kind of species you have. And if you can, try to incorporate some integrated tactics like using mulch along with a good uh, mulch, you know, help keep the, the, keep the weeds down early in the season and then coming back with those post-emergence herbicides. All right. And with that, I will be happy to try to answer any question, any more questions. Yes, ma'am. Do you know what the motivation is behind making a dry formulation of Chateau? A dry formulation of Chateau um, or versus a liquid formulation? Yeah, it's just there's so much harder to calibrate. I'm just wondering why. Well, generally, your dry formulations require more tank agitation. Than, than a liquid formulation. I mean, if you if your if your sprayers if you you know take a lunch break and you sit in your, in your sprayer, that's gonna that dry formulation is gonna settle out and it's in your herbicide. And without a, that agitation, your herbicide application is not gonna be as effective. So that's why they're kind of going to that liquid formulation. Oh, all right. So it's not a granular formulation to apply as a granular. No, it's not a granular formulation. It's just it comes as a dry and you mix it in water. So they're changing it to liquid. Yes. Make it easier. Okay. Thanks. What about Palmer here on the shore? Is it really spreading a lot more? Are you finding a lot more? Uh, I am seeing Palmer spread a lot more. Um, it's obviously in our agro agronomic corn and soybean fields. I see it in a lot of vegetable fields uh, in between the rows of plastic. I actually did a study, I've done a study over the past two years looking at a spring seeded grass cover crop where we planted that early on in the season. We basically laid the plastic about six weeks early, uh, seeded that cover crop, let that cover crop grow, and that actually get, and then planted our cash crop we did watermelons, we did peppers, we did cucumbers, um, while that cover crop was still growing. Then, then we terminated the cover crop with like a shielded application to Paraquat. And then having that cover crop residue on the ground really helps. We got a nice reduction in weed density and biomass before we terminated that cover crop. And we got pretty good weed control after several weeks after we terminated the cover crop. I mean, looking at, you know, 80 to 90 per, 80 to 90 percent control. Mm -hmm. and, and so, palm amaranth wasn't a big problem using those techniques. No. And uh, you know, because I was looking at some of the agronomic crops, you know, sort of Maryland Delaware border. You've seen a lot of palm in in, in in surgeries. And those, yeah, and those were deck techniques and you know help reduce Palmer amaranth this is right now one of the best things you can hope for because it's better to have maybe one or two Palmer plants in your field that you have to get rid of than seeing you know 30 feet of row of something that's completely infested with Palmer because I have pulled Palmer amaranth from between 30 feet of row and plastic and that alone took me more than an hour to do. And, <laughs> uh, the, resist the herbicide resistance issues are incredible. I don't even know what's still working. Well, and unfortunately, you know, things like Gramoxone and Rely, they still work on Palmer amaranth, but, you know, fruit and vegetables, they just don't have as many products that are available, especially that control Palmer in crop. Okay. There's a uh, weed wiper that we use. I've used it in my strawberries, you know, because you, you don't have as many options, but it's, it's kind of shaped like a hockey stick and it's got a wipe on the end, a sponge. You can't use it with, a, you know, like an ATV sprayer set up with an electric motor, but you can use it with one of those four gallon backpack pump up style and wipe it on different things because, uh, you know, you, you, if anybody heard strawberries, you can can the thistle in them and trying to handle that, you 
spray stinger, that's got to be 30 days before you harvest. You know, and anything, I've heard anything after 10% bloom is going to, you know, impact your yield negatively. So, you know, weed wiper with some Roundup, and it seems to slow some things down. But that, you know, that plant, those seeds are ready much sooner than you think. When it's green and you cut it down, you can grab that seed head and even though the plant hasn't started to dry down or anything, you can get those little black seeds out of a lot of those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, that, uh, some places I wasn't expecting to see palm ramrick and waterhead. Just surprising the heck out of me where it's popping up. But when you're talking about that weed wiper, it reminds me of the old product in the states, and of course, I still have a couple of hanging in my shed. Where the liquid hoe, which was a PVC shape, like a sort of like a hoe, with a piece of wick, and you put your uh, glyphosate in, in the PVC tube, and you use the gallon. And same, same concept. Yeah. Yeah, you'd be surprised how far a gallon goes with that weed wiper. I don't, I don't put four gallons of water on my back at eight, eight and a half pounds. <laughs> So, yeah. All right. Any other questions for Kurt? When's, when do Palmer plants germinate? I've never really had to deal with them. Um, the palm, is, is that an early spring germination? Or? This, it's a year long germ or, or season long germination. Oh, They're going to yeah. start when it first warms up in around April and they can germinate through October. And the seed bank is incredible too. It's just like if you're out of pig weeds, the seed will last. For, it's not only prolific, but it will last for years. Well, uh, the seed bank itself isn't prolific. The, the, se the seeds, you know, Palmer plant, female Palmer plants will produce about around 100,000 seeds per plant. Um, however, they're short lived seeds, only about, you know, two to three years in the soil, but you keep getting Palmer over and over. And that's you know just one plant in your field. You're going to see that infestation. Thank you. Think about songbirds. We've all got parts of the farm that we don't quite manage for weeds, and once in a while, three times a year, whatever you drive by, and you're like, yeah, there's that thing I ought to be managing over there. But when you don't mow it and you leave it, then the songbirds get in there at this time of year, the winter. You know, they're looking for food, and you know they're passing that kind of stuff around. Um, you know, it's nature's way that we're trying to fight but you know there's there's a lot of ways they can move around so thank you Kurt right. Kurt's a huge asset here on the farm I can't tell you how many times I walk in his office with a question and next thing you know we've got three textbooks open that are about this thick <laughs>